Um, okay, down here. Um, something else to say here is when people are drawing the picture, again, I've been trying to show you the take your time technique and the one step at a time technique. What are the wrong ways? Well, a lot of people use, again, the one fell swoop technique. That doesn't work. And also, a lot of people draw, use the draw what feels good technique. A lot of people just kind of draw a picture that feels right to them. Well, your instructor knows the exact traps to put on the test so that what feels right is wrong. So you have to avoid drawing a picture that feels good to yourself. It's not based on what we want, uh, what feels good. It's based on what the arrows tell us to do. You have to obey what the arrows are telling you to do. Um, not what you've seen, uh, not, not what feels like the right picture. Again, if you draw a big picture, it's easier to see what's going on. A fresh piece of paper for every problem is a good idea. Uh, okay. Um, so we made an alcohol. Uh, while we're at it, did we make a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Tertiary. Right? Because the alcohol carbon is attached to three carbon chains. The alcohol carbon is attached to three carbon chains. So this is uh, tertiary. Next time you want to sit further off to the side than you want to have any trouble seeing. Okay. So, by the way, we've learned, learned something more. Earlier we said that a Grignard plus a ketone makes an alcohol. But now we know a Grignard plus a ketone makes a tertiary alcohol. A Grignard plus a ketone makes a tertiary alcohol. That's always going to be true. A Grignard plus a ketone makes a tertiary alcohol. You should be able to figure that out, though, if you forgot it. Because after all, in a ketone, how many carbons is the carbonyl carbon attached to? Two. Two. And then when the Grignard comes in, that'll be three. That's why we end up with a tertiary. So that's just kind of the common sense of the situation. Okay, um, if we had all the time in the world, I would keep giving you more basic Grignard problems, because you can see it really takes practice to get these down, but I think this is enough, and you can now go and do these on your own. So we'll go on to the next step for Grignards, because there's still other very important things you have to talk about for Grignards. But you can see, you won't be able to get points on the test with this unless you do a lot of practice with this on your own, because every single problem, there's many opportunities for mistakes. Okay. So to review, we've learned what you can do with the Grignard. There's two things, that, uh, there's two things we've learned you can do with the Grignard. First, you can deprotonate an electronegative atom. You can use a Grignard to deprotonate an electronegative atom. Or you can use a Grignard to attack an aldehyde or a ketone. Those are the only two things that we've learned to do with Grignards. So you should not be doing anything else with Grignards. For example, Grignards don't do SN2 reactions. The only things that we've learned to do with Grignards are attack a carbonyl and uh, deprotonate an electronegative atom. Now, um, there is one other thing you're going to learn to do with a Grignard at this point in the course. We might not get to that today because it's not as important. But anyway, don't do Grignards for just anything in the world, only the things we've, that we've specifically learned. Uh, maybe just to, to mention it, Grignards also attack these guys. You might have seen these in class. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to talk about these. These are not as important as aldehydes and ketones. Uh, but just for the record, Grignards also attack a three-membered ring with an, uh, with an oxygen. So the only things you'd ever do with a Grignard are attack this, an aldehyde or a ketone, or deprotonate an oxygen or a nitrogen. Nothing else. So it just break apart the, the circle, right? Yeah, it sounds like you can. Uh, you might be able to figure out what it does. Yeah, what you said is right. So you can kind of figure out. It's a lot similar to attacking a carbonyl, because this is a delta-positive carbon, I guess. Oxacyclopropane is one name. There's many different names for this. Your textbook calls it oxacyclopropane. Hopefully, now that we've gone over green yards, maybe you can learn about this on your own in the textbook. Maybe this will make more sense to you now. All right, but let's stick with the key reactions uh, that we've already seen so far. Now, again, we said that the green yard can either deprotonate an electronegative atom, that means acting like a base, or it can attack a uh, aldehyde or ketone. If it has a choice, which one will it do? If it could do both, which one will it do? Deprotonate a electronegative atom. It would rather act like a base. But remember, it can't deprotonate anybody. It can't deprotonate a carbon. It can only deprotonate an electronegative atom like an oxygen. Okay. All right. So, um, well, so that's what you can do with a Grignard. But we haven't talked about how to make Grignards, which is why I think you asked me at the beginning. So that's very important as well. We have to know how to make Grignards. Well, this is the general formula for a Grignard, right? Here we have the general formula for a Grignard. A carbon chain attached to a, a magnesium attached to a halogen. Uh, you wouldn't want to use fluorine, fluorine here, but a halogen. Is X always a halogen? 
Yeah, X stands for halogen in organic chemistry. X stands for halogen in organic chemistry. Uh, we know that maybe a better way to write this would be like this. But these are identical. These are the same thing. These are two ways of writing the same thing. So we have to ask how to make this. Let's look at this reaction. All right, I will now tell you what happens in this reaction. So I'm going to use the redraw and modify technique. I've just redrawn the starting material so far, and now I'm going to modify it to make it correct. Um, this is what's called an insertion reaction. And it'll be clear in a second why it's called an insertion. We're simply going to insert the magnesium between the bromine and the alpha carbon. This is the alpha carbon, right? The alpha carbon is the one with the functional group. So we're going to insert the magnesium between the bromine and the alpha carbon. So this is the product. You simply insert the magnesium between the bromine and the alpha carbon. This is very simple to draw the product of this reaction. Now, um, one thing that you should be uh, maybe curious about is what's the mechanism? At this point in the course, we should know how valuable it is to know mechanisms. Oh, but I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, we're not going to learn the mechanism for this reaction. I think they might show the mechanism in the book, but it's not really a useful mechanism. You should not worry about this mechanism. This is not an important mechanism to know for the course. Um, so this is a rare case where we will never show the mechanism. We will not show the mechanism here. We're just going to go straight from the starting materials to the products without worrying about the mechanism. Well, that makes our life very easy. This is a very easy reaction to deal with. You just insert the magnesium between the, uh, between the bromine and the carbon. So what else do we have to do to make the Grignard reagents? Separate. Right. Or really, nothing. We're done. Right? All we have to do is rewrite it in the more useful form. We have, so we've answered your question from the start about how to make a Grignard. Just go ahead and rewrite this. How would you rewrite that? Okay. Good. All you have to do, first step, just erase the covalent bond. So I'm going to just erase the covalent bond, and then I'll put the negative charge on the alpha carbon and the positive charge on the magnesium. So what do you do when you see this reaction? First, insert the magnesium between the alpha carbon and the bromine. Then erase the covalent bond and put a negative charge on the alpha carbon and a positive charge on the magnesium. And that's how you make the Grignard reagents. All right. Um, the correct solvent for this is another aprotic solvent. We should use an aprotic solvent, again, maybe an ether. Uh, an ether or some other uh, aprotic solvent would be a good solvent to use here. Um, remember, ethers look like this. Ethers are oxygens bonded to two carbon chains. This is aprotic because it has an oxygen and it has protons, but none of the protons are on the oxygen. This is aprotic because there's no hydrogens on the oxygen. Um, so this is not uh, the kind of thing that tends to get deprotonated. Why should we not use a protic solvent? What would happen if we used a protic solvent yeah, it would defeat our whole purpose. The instant that we made the Grignard, it would destroy it. Right? Remember, you have to keep Grignards away from protic solvents, so you certainly would not want to make one in a protic solvent, because then that would immediately uh, destroy it the instant that it got made. Good. Looks like you guys are on top of that. All right, you got this example. Uh,
By the way, you don't even need to bother putting the delta positive over here, because we're not really interested in the mechanism here. First step, insert the magnesium between the bromine and the alpha carbon. Maybe it helps to label the alpha carbon here. Insert the magnesium between the bromine and the alpha carbon. Again, that's why this is called an insertion. Then, we've got the Grignard, but let's make this more useful to ourselves. So then we erase the covalent bond. Don't erase the alpha carbon, though. The alpha carbon is still here. And now we can use this to do more reactions. OK, so I think a common mistake here, a common mistake might be to get this. So this would be wrong. So take your time. This would be wrong. OK, all right. <coughs> All right, um, we don't have too much more time left, but now would be a good time to introduce how to do synthesis uh, with Grignard's. Does that sound okay? All right.